So if the title of the talk is how we got to the now is the time to act globally. So I'll, I'll start with some disclosures. Number one, um, I don't have any disclosures. <laughs> Number two, uh, I'm associated with two groups. Uh, I'm salaried from Resolve to Save Lives. That's a nonprofit um, in New York. It's a division of a large organization called Iowa Strategy. I'm currently in senior position for the Permanent Home Medical Group in California. And that's a, 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 a position group, the sole position group, which provides the care for Kaiser Permanente, which is an integrated health care system in Northern California. So let me just put this picture up here. For 25 years, I practiced in a uh, suburban medical center where um, uh, it was middle class, lower middle class individuals. Most of them had jobs, um, uh, not all, and it was a very working class neighborhood. And I thought that that was uh, really important, valuable work, and I thought it was hard work. And then about a year and a half ago, I was asked to um, kind of change career paths and to help address cardiovascular disease globally. And I had, in my 25 years at Kaiser Permanente, I, I had some experience in setting up systems. I said, you know, we're taking care of patients one at a time. Maybe we can do better. So one thing led to another. After uh, five or 10 or 15 years, I was part of a large um, kind of a culture change where we really looked at the global health of the people we cared for, and that was in Northern California. So um, I had a chance to join Resolve to Save Lives. And this is a picture of actually, I didn't realize this at the time, but Dr. Khan was actually in the community team. Dr. Khan is yeah. in the community there. Much like Dr. Patetti said, um, part of our work is going to remote places and talking to them about cardiovascular health. And so I know that I'm in the stroke belt. We have a slide here of the map of hypertension across the United States, and you can see that South Carolina is smack dab in the middle uh, with one of the highest uh, hypertension rates. But you know, hypertension isn't a problem only in South Francisco, where I work, or in California, United States, or even South Carolina. It's a big problem. So this is a funny story. Um, I was it was in Hanoi, and they said we want to take you to a rural health clinic. And um, they said it's only they, they said it's about uh, four hours away. And we were in Ethiopia previously, and a four-hour ride in Ethiopia on a straight road in the desert, you can go quite a distance. But a four-hour drive to Vietnam, you actually don't get very far. <laughs> we had to stop because many people uh, were motion sick. We had to stop about two hours uh, into the trip and let a couple people out to take care of some issues, and then get back in the car. Uh, and then we were almost, it's been about three and a half hours, and the bus pulls up to a lake. And um, a bunch of these like motor, motorized canoes. Um, and um, we just got in our canoes and our suits and we went across the clinic and we, we went across the river and we um, got to the clinic and, and we talked to them about what, what, they, what, you know, what they needed, what their problems were. And they were telling us that uh, they you know, were doing their best with what they had. I think they had a couple of, a couple of drugs in the cabinet that they changed from month to month. But they were really focused on cardiovascular disease. And they had a, we even had a protocol poster, but they even had some, some uh, rudimentary protocols up on the wall. And it just really struck me that, that the hypertension and other forms of preventive, other things we can do to prevent cardiovascular disease really would, would be good here. And so you could go to all corners of the, of the earth and find that it's a problem. And everybody is looking at the problem and trying to address it differently. So <laughs> South Carolina is right in the middle of the dark blue. And dark blue is the highest prevalence of hypertension, approaching 30%. I won't pretend to be an expert in cardiovascular disease in South Carolina, but every presentation I've ever heard, whether it's from someone from the South or not, always talks about how the hypertension, although it affects, on average, 20 to 25% of all uh, adults in the country, is much higher in the South. And when I heard earlier today the speakers talking about uh, the tremendous burden of stroke, of you know fatal and some might argue non-fatal strokes, and even a greater burden on the individual and the family, it really uh, it really makes you think about the systems that we can 
must go or can go to the rest for minimal cardiovascular disease, but there's definitely a problem in the South. So I just want to leave you with some background. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the world, whether you're on a boat going to Vietnam or whether you're driving down the street in Buda Vachal's area. Despite the pre presence of effective strategies, clinicians and healthcare systems fail to systematically apply these strategies to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And I felt a little funny because I don't want to think, I'm not indicating anybody here is a failure, but I think as a system, we can do better. And this session will address the global burden of cardiovascular disease, and we'll talk about systems to address, address gaps in practice. And the learning objectives is we'd like everyone to recognize that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the world, and we'll identify three strategies that, if implemented, can significantly reduce the burden of that cardiovascular disease. It's pretty simple, right? We just do those three things, and we've solved the world's problems, but it's not so simple. Um, some resources are a description of the organization that I joined, um, Saving 100 Million Lives by Food and Food and Treatment Hypertension. You can go to our website, and also go to the World Health Organization website. <coughs> and, um, Dr. Khan, I want to thank Kasim in the back for um, organizing a lot of the work on the Global Heart Initiative. And what the Global Heart Initiative is, it's um, we'll go over it in a sec, but it's a great package of of high value activities that are implemented in the community to really reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease. So my position uh, is a New York-based organization, and we don't, we can't do it alone. And I just put this up here because the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the Center for Disease Control, um, the Global Health Advocacy Movement Incubator, and I've heard the term advocacy mentioned here earlier in the room, so it's in the Dean's blog, but advocacy is important because if we do things alone and no one knows about it, and there's no pressure for these things to occur, yeah, it makes it harder. Uh, also, we have uh, my organization has donors from the Bloomberg Philanthropy, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the organization that I work in, work in uh, is global, and we focus primarily, <coughs> excuse me, in low middle income countries. And you can see from our map that we're in many places, primarily in India and China because that's where a lot of the burden is. But also in Central America, South America, excuse me, Africa, uh, Asia, and Europe. What's different about our initiative? Well, we really think about speed, simplicity, and scale. And I'll say that again, speed, simplicity, and scale. If we can make cardiovascular disease a treatment that was simple, then we can scale it get it to a lot of places and go fast. If we make things complicated, it's very hard to do, to broaden them, and it's very hard to broaden things quickly. So every intervention, or any, any policy or process we think about, I always think of it through that lens, speed, simplicity, and scale. So I ask you, when is 50 plus 30 plus zero equal 100? Well, if we can reduce, if we can increase hypertension control by from, four, from an average control rate of 14% to 50%, and if we can decrease sodium consumption by 30% across the world, and we can get artificial trans fat down to zero, because artificial fat that has no business being in our food supply, and we can save 100 million lives. It might take 25 or 30 years, but we have to start someplace. So let's talk about hypertension. So the people in this room, I think, recognize but hypertension is a big problem. And what's really interesting is that all that hypertension alone is responsible for more deaths on this planet than anything else. It's responsible for more deaths when you count up heart attacks and strokes, but mostly it's the cause of death of two other reasons. It causes more death than all the infectious diseases combined. And what's really striking is that I think it's you ask non-clinicians on the street, and maybe if you even ask some clinicians, they wouldn't recognize this. There's been a tremendous focus on fighting emergently infectious diseases. Right? We hear so much about really important infections, the infectious diseases, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, etc., Ebola. We get a lot of press. It's very, uh, uh, very uh, interesting. It makes for great news stories. But 
this very boring story about this unrelenting pressure of the burden of hypertension and its impact on cardiovascular disease isn't very newsworthy. We have to make for good high headlines. There's nothing splashy about it. Yet, when you see a figure like this, and you see that hypertension alone is responsible for more deaths across the world than anything else, it makes you, it, it, it makes me wonder, what is it that we can do and should do to grab, the, to grab the system and to shake it up and to really to redirect its focus and our focus to addressing things that should prevent heart attack and stroke. So the people in this room understand that this silent killer can cause problems with uh, many organ systems, heart, brain, kidney, you know, that kidney, vascular system, and so on. Well, here's a, uh, a tough graphic. That there's 1.4 billion people on the planet with hypertension. And only 14% of them are under control. And there are only 200 million under control. And so, and so what's the problem? Well, the problem is there are many steps there are many reasons why the control is only 14%. The first problem is only half of the people know they have hypertension. So how on earth are we going to control hypertension if half the people with hypertension don't know they have hypertension? <coughs> but for people that say, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a screening program. We're just going to screen everybody. We're going to set up and put shopping centers in the faith-based programs and in the schools and every place we're going to set up screening programs. Would that get you to high levels of control? Probably not. Because even amongst the people who are aware, only two-thirds are treated. And amongst those people who are treated, only one in three of the treated people have their blood pressure under control. So we have, I call these voltage drops, but there's several different areas where hypertension treatment or control of hypertension, uh, there is a problem. There are probably, there are, I suspect there are many more, but it's awareness, treatment, and treatment with control. And each of these steps requires a different intervention or a different way to think about how to get the problem. And I mentioned before that because hypertension isn't splashy, that it's not that newsworthy, it's just always there, kind of always, always in the background always present. There's no outbreak of hypertension in some faraway land where we can send a CNN reporter, right, or a box reporter, and send them there with a, you know, hazmat suit, right, from the field near the MASH hospital. It's just always there. Uh, and so would you believe that um, less than 1% of global spending is spent on non-communicable diseases like hypertension, and cardiovascular diseases? when it, it's responsible for more deaths than anything else on the planet. And so that is a major, major disconnect. Well, can we do anything about hypertension? Can we do anything about preventing cardiovascular disease? Well, sure. Smoking, this is a different, this is a graph of uh, some research done from New York on American patients, but I assume we generalize this, that you know, if we work on smoking cessation, we can save a bunch of lives. If we prescribe, prescribe aspirin, mostly for people who've already had a heart attack or stroke, yeah, we can save some lives. We control cholesterol, yeah, we can save some lives. But what we can, but the condition with the highest prevalence and the condition when it's treated for which we have the greatest impact on cardiovascular is still hypertension. So even when I'm in conversations with people about, when we talk about hypertension, people talk about atherostatins also. My response is, well, let's take care of hypertension first. If you want to do atherostatins, no problem, but let's take care of hypertension. Let's focus on hypertension, and if you want to do atherostatins, be my guest. But you know, hypertension is the ticket to control, to addressing the world's hypertension problem. So question one, and I understand it's for senior credit, we have to um, uh, ask these questions, and I will provide you the answer. So, what is the leading cause of death in the world? Is it cardiovascular disease? Is it HIV AIDS? Is it tuberculosis? Is it malaria? And Jennifer, how should I know if I have to see answers on the next slide, but tell me 
how this works. Are we supposed to have people? Okay. All right. How many people think? We'll go backwards. We'll make it. We'll go backwards. How many people think this is number four? Raise your hand. How many people think it's number three? TV. Raise your hand. How many people think it's number two? HIV AIDS. How many people think it's number one? Cardiovascular disease. Okay, good. Everybody's getting their 13.5 hours of candy. Is that right? Oh, no, sorry. You got, okay, sorry. That, that was getting trouble down. But. Okay, so we'll go to next here. There we go. That is correct. The leading cause of death in the world is cardiovascular disease. Of the 57 million deaths worldwide in 2016, Ischemic heart disease and stroke are the world's, world's biggest killer, accounting for a combined 15.2 million deaths in 2016. These diseases have remained the leading cause of death globally for 15 years. So hot off the press, hypertension is still killing more people than anything else and, address, and attracting 1.7% of global resources. Hypertension is a big problem. Well, how are we going to address it? Well, I'm going to present to you several slides here which talk about frameworks for addressing hypertension. And the organization I work with, Resolve to Save Lives, looked at the evidence and looked at the Global Heart Initiative from um, uh, the World Heart the World, uh, from the World Health Organization. Looked at a few other resources, and we decided that well, we're going to kind of bump, work it off of five different uh, pillars. Or, uh, can do it, a medical assistant can do it, an eye assistant, anyone can do it. It's just boom, 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 boom. It's not something you need a magnifying glass with all this branching and all this this, that, and these whole dotted lines. It's just this, 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 this. Because if we do that, then we can do it here, we can do it in San Francisco, we can do it in Vietnam. It's just do A, do B, do C, do D. Not if A, then B, then if C or D, then order this test, and then you know, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Boom, 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 boom. And if you do that, you have something pretty straightforward, and that's it. getting a simple problem. Getting a simple protocol is a hard problem. So when I say simple problem, I don't mean it's simple to get, but it's got to be simple if we want to if we want to hear everything else. Like for example, if we want to make sure there's enough drugs in your clinics, if we say, well, it could be any drug, what's the first drug going on? The guidelines say it could be any. It could be any of this class, this class. It's actually, there are four drugs for which you could prescribe, four classes of drugs, which the most recent American Heart Association guidelines say that you could prescribe. And of each of those drugs, there's probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 options. And each of those options probably has three or four doses. So it's a several hundred different options. So tell me a protocol that's going to work, where the first option, first choice is pick among 400 options. And the second choice is pick amongst 399 options. And the third choice is pick amongst, amongst 398 options. So to me, that's not a simple protocol. But if you have a protocol and it says, we'll use this drug in most patients at this dose, and then use this drug at most, and then if you do this, then you can start to work about, you can think about medication supply. You can make sure that your pharmacy has all those pills. Because we're going to get a, we need a whole bunch of those pills in the pharmacy. A whole bunch. Can you, can't, can you just guarantee me those pills are going to be there? So that when I tell my patient to go there, they're there. And if you do that, maybe the price will be more affordable because you can buy in bulk. Also, if you do that, and now you have a bunch of pills in the pharmacy that you know are there, and if, if one pill, because you think that's probably going to work for 75 to 80% of the patients, of course there'll be exceptions which should be managed by exceptions, but we're talking about most patients. Then you can have community-based treatment, which means maybe the patients don't have to drive all over town from pharmacy to pharmacy to find that drug. Maybe um, if uh, uh, maybe uh, by having uh, task sharing, by having someone else participate in a very simple protocol, maybe it's a lot easier for your patient to be cared for at the home or by themselves. <coughs> maybe not having the case of Vietnam, not having to go across the river and go to the district hospital to see the specialist. Maybe the healthcare worker could do it there. And if we do that, we call it patient centered, meaning the patient doesn't have to drive as far or, or take a boat as far. And then if we had information systems like keeping track of things, like how often did you prescribe that? And what's your hypertension control rate? And uh, did your pharmacy have the pills there? And how is clinic A doing versus clinic, compared to clinic B? 
And if he did that based off a simple protocol that just had five or six steps, imagine the power of simplification. So I think whenever I look at a complex problem, I think the answer is simple. <coughs> and I, but getting there is very hard. So complex problems are complex. The solutions must be simple. But it's complicated to get that simple solution. But that's your job. I think our job. Well, this is a, this is a great. You say, Mark, that's a great idea. We're so proud of you for coming up with that great idea. That's so novel. Well, it's really not novel. Okay, so the World Health Organization has essentially the same thing. They have the heart technical package. The H is for healthy lifestyle, and the E is but the E is for evidence-based protocols. The A is for access to medicines. The R is for risk-based management. Maybe you start with patients who are older. Maybe you do a risk score. Maybe you don't. Probably don't start with those super young patients. Maybe you start with patients who have hypertension and hand diabetes. Again, when you when you have a lot of patients to treat, you probably should prioritize who it is you're going to start with. I'm not saying you should. Um, you should uh, withhold care from lower risk patients, but you might want to prioritize who you can start with. Um, team based care, we talked about cash sharing, and the systems for monitoring. So, <clears throat> what's interesting is that our, our global package, which is all this advice, is very similar to the heart technical package. Actually, it's the same. We're just sort of uh, refocusing on some of the high risk important issues. And here's what's also sort of funny this was an article I published in 2016 before I was a member of this. Uh, with all this advice organization, I was working at Kaiser Permanente. And you look at the things that Kaiser Permanente does, which you didn't mention, but it's actually the same. So as opposed to brilliant people coming up with these brilliant ideas, I think what you're seeing is people with experience in the field have one way or another either stumbled onto a similar path or, or masterfully created a beautiful mechanism. But you can see these are all the same things. Um, in hypertension, we published this, actually not having seen the heart technical package and not knowing about this open source pipeline, about having hypertension registry, which is like a list of patients, like information system, performance feedback, which you heard from the dean, which is telling people how to drink, a treatment algorithm, which is evidence-based, medical assistance for blood pressure measurement, you could, that's team-based care and cash sharing, uh, and then single code combination therapy, which is availability of medication. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a couple of days. But again, these are the, the, the key issues. But I would point out that having all those systems together, you know, having a, a protocol, focusing on task sharing, having drugs available, and having an information system, those four components will actually lead to patient-centered care. And all three of these models really focus on the same thing. Um, and so when we just talk a little bit more about protocols, I would point out that what, see, see this protocol, this is, it looks pretty strict, right? It's basically do A, B, C, D, E, F. So this is something where I would feel comfortable. You know, for, I'm not talking about a super comfortable. Whenever you bring, bring this up, people say, oh yeah, but I have a patient with all these other comorbidities and all these drug sensitivities, and this protocol won't work for them, so therefore we should never use a protocol. And I'm like, no, no, that, that's a patient that needs some, some, something special. But for every patient that you tell me about that, there's eight patients for, the, for whom a standard protocol is probably worth just fine. And there's advantages to using a single protocol because your other people on the team can do it. If, I call it, if I'm at a conference, someone else sort of knows the general way that you practice in the system. Again, if the drugs are always in the pharmacy, maybe the pharmacist will be able to counsel the patient about that drug, and the pharmacist will be better counseling the patient based on having a familiar Protocol. One other thing is that if you have a finite number of drugs and doses, then the medical assistant to your office can pronounce all of the names of the medication and doesn't have to say, I never heard of that pill, I mispronounced it. And again, there's so many benefits to having a simple protocol. And whenever I give this talk, I have usually someone in the audience shouts, no branching, because in my perfect world, a protocol really doesn't have any branching. It doesn't start skinny at the top and move down. Because I think when you talk about task sharing and having other people on the team work on it, it makes the, the, each of those branches a decision point. And medical decision making is difficult. And it's also, in my opinion, a barrier to getting down a protocol. Um, so in my opinion, the uh, best protocols are linear. Also, I would suggest that we have a drug and dose specific. So as opposed to saying, 
step one, pick any ACE inhibitor. I would say, well, no, your system decides it. We're going to use this ACE inhibitor, this dose. It would say, pick Pisinopol at 20 milligram dose, or whatever it is. But <coughs> the key is to have something standard. And this will ease not only logistics, but also training, supervision, and evaluation. This happens to be the one that we use in Nordicale for the Kaiser, which is, look on the left, it says for people who aren't pregnant. And it's one pill that happens to be a single pill combination. We use a half, one or two, that doesn't work. Use a second pill, which is amlodipine, a half, one or two, but that doesn't work in the spinal relaxant. But basically, by the time you get the third drug, you're on, or the third pill, you're on four drugs. And I think the names of the drugs are really unimportant here, but you can see that this is what, what most people do in my health organization. Start with a single pill combination, titrate it, go to a second pill, titrate it. If not, we used to refer those patients for resistant hypertension, but for resistant hypertension, we use a lot of spinal relaxant. So we even have our primary care doctors treating resistant hypertension. Um, what's interesting, someone said, spironolaxone, I never heard of spironolaxone. It actually is re it's recently, 2015, uh, American College of Cardiology recommendation for resistant hypertension and also um, and the European uh, Society of Hypertension uh, guidelines for that. So this, even though this is a few years old for Kaiser Permanente, this is uh, 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 current other guidelines as well. But I wouldn't focus on the bottom, it's on the top. It's having a linear, linear protocol I think is useful. The heart program, which is a global process, really, again, it's just a very linear protocol. So you do A, you do B, you do C, you do D. And there's seven of them there. <coughs> and there's a, there's a contentious debate about which is the best protocol, which you should start with. I don't think it really matters. I think you should just have a protocol. Um, and it should be based on the evidence and should work in your system. You should be able to get the pills there. But it shouldn't be my protocol doesn't be your protocol doesn't. So I think that the protocol should be based on what the community um, should do. And I think there's a lot of latitude to pick something, but this will have a lot of advantages for purchasing power, training, et cetera. I also went to Hanan, China, and we couldn't really read it, we had to have it translated, but we recognize some of the words here. And what they use is lunitapine, which is a calcium channel blocker, which is manufactured, I think, I think it's a Singapore patent that went off patent that is now manufactured in China in this province. And they want to use that instead of amlodipine. But again, they have the dose, they have an advantage. A, the dose of the first drug, the dose of the second drug, the dose of the third drug. And what's interesting is we went there and this was stuck on a lot of the walls of the primary care doctors. And again, when you see this, you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of people could do this on the team. And then look how easy it would be for them to say, do we have enough pelvic partners in the pharmacy? So again, I wouldn't focus on the drugs, but focusing on the fact that if it's quite straightforward, it would really work. So this, I think, is really important. Having a protocol really drives the both drive, allows you to have uh, the rest of the components. And I would point out that a protocol is not a guideline. Many times I've been to some places, oh, we have a protocol. Here's a 395 page Indian Society of Hypertension guideline. I'm like, no, that's you can't give that to a healthcare worker and say, follow the protocol. There's minimal training. And in India, here's an example. This is in Punjab. Again, can you see the boom, 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 boom? So again, we're starting to see these primary care protocols really being drug and dose specific and be non-branching. Um, so I also think information systems are important because what gets, what gets managed is what's measured. So if you don't measure something, how do you know if you're doing well at it? So again, I think that's super important. You can improve follow-up. You can measure something quarterly or yearly. They can be paper-based. They probably better on a computer, but I know that there are places that don't on paper. As a matter of fact, I think there's a program in South Carolina where the postcard mailed in for two years. What was it? That? Right? Yeah, I read it. Yeah, I read about this. Yeah. So Finger Lakes in New York. So you look for, hey, who's done this in the private practice? you end up finding it in the Finger Lake region of New York and in South Carolina, where first it was on a postcard, right? Voluntary physicians, voluntary visit postcards, and later it was a computer. Yeah, so again, this is a model. I mentioned that model when I see the other places. So again, you don't have to have a computer. It itself is on a computer, but you can do it if you have the sheer will. So go South Carolina. Um, uh, and also, but you need to then do something with those postcards. Look at them, I'll put them in a spreadsheet, give them back to the doc and the clinic and say, hey, clinic A, how are you doing today? Clinic B, et cetera. Um, 
Again, the World Health Organization has three indicators, and you could have more or less, but these indicators are being reported globally, and one is how are the patients doing at six months, and another one is how is everybody doing every year, and a third one is let's do a survey every three to five years, and the survey is different because you just go off the clipboard with the band and you survey people in the community, and it's, it's different from what the clinics report. So like we have NHANES here, right, in the United States, and they have steps, other places that get surveyed. But if your NHANES data is way off from what your clinics are reporting, then, then maybe you're falling. So again, NHANES, the national survey, don't come out all the time, but if your prevalence is in your clinic is about what you expected based on NHANES, probably good. If your prevalence is way off based on NHANES, then maybe you just miss a patient. Um, so blood pressure is controlled, but some patients, some countries do it better. In the United States, it's down to about 55 percent. Look at Canada again, you know, an integrated system where they're in charge of a lot of things all together, um, much higher. But in England, another integrated system, blood pressure control isn't so well. So we talked today about having a, an integrated healthcare system, but having an integrated healthcare system alone is not sufficient to take care of hypertension control. How much does it cost to save a life? Well, if you figure that you could get a low-cost generic for about two dollars a year, right? Which is not outrageous when you think about the cost of hydrochloride or um, generic like Simple or even some of the generic ACE or R, ACE or ARBs. Then this is a sad fact that if you treated one, if you treated people. Um, Year with pills, that's how much the complication, the, com the cost of complications for every day would pay for a year's worth of medication for the whole world. In other words, there are so many strokes and heart attacks happening all around the world that if you were to treat the patients, we could um, save a lot of lives. And it's about $750 per life you're saved, which is a, a really good buy. And uh, 10 million pe people a day are dying across the world, so we should probably do something quickly. Um, and I also point out about single pill combinations, and I saw a, 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 a poster here um, by uh, Trace, here, I know he was here today, talking about it, about, you know, in South Carolina, are people using single pill combinations? And I have a bias in my organization to use single pill combinations. You've got two pills in one. Uh, and uh, what's nice about that is that, you know, most people use two drugs anyway to keep hypertension. Why not just put people on two pills in the get go? Why not put one on? Why not just put two drugs in the same capsule? The tablet make it easy for everybody. And so that seems like a no brainer, but that's not on the World Health Organization's essential medication list. So when you go to a place like China or India or Ethiopia, we say, hey, why don't you guys put a low, a low cost generic single pill combination? Why don't you guys use that? So jumpstart is, is, a, is, a, is a way farther along. Uh, and the answer is, well, that's not on the essential medication list. So there's a petition to get this on a global essential medication list. Uh, and I would point out that uh, there's a recent uh, combination pill try um, done, and this was done in um, Sri Lanka. So actually most single pill combinations are tested in first world countries, but this was a triple combination pill, and it was used in Sri Lanka. And again, it worked, it was only a six month trial. But again, thinking about using more than one drug at, at the initiation of therapy, or at least soon in the hypertension therapy, uh, really can move things forward quickly. And then um, Dr. Petty uh, and Jamario, uh, Steve from here as well, uh, uh, have submitted a paper which is going to be published soon. Um, and I put the title up here, but uh, fixed dose combination of pharmacological therapy to improve hypertension. Control worldwide as perspectives. It's really nice. This article, um, when it comes out, I suggest you read it. It talks about which which single pill combination you might want to use in order to control hypertension. Uh, we talk about information, and you go to some places, and there's no infrastructure to get information. Uh, in that clinic in Vietnam, I showed you, or the place in Ethiopia, um, where they have paper and pencils. Uh, they don't have a lot of computers there. So part of our organization's mission is to have a open source free app, which is going to be Android based because uh, in India that's where most people use, not um, uh, not iPhone based, not Apple operating system based. And it'll be free, and but then be technically out there. We go to 
simple.org and see what we have. But the key is for, uh, you know, as opposed to sending out postcards like they did, I think, in um, uh, South Carolina about 10 years ago, we will have the offering free, a downloadable free app, and which you can just put the blood pressure and the unique identifier on there and go back to the cloud and you can give performance feedback to anyone that wants it. Now, what's cool about this is that there are a lot of apps out there for hypertension, but there aren't any apps which are really talking about, they just get the blood pressure and the demographics, because that's really all you need to be able to feed that and tell people how they're doing. So if you're interested in tech, then this is something that you can deploy right now and think about doing yet. So question number two, which of the following are components of a successful hypertension program? Um, let's have a show of hands. We'll, we'll read them all first and we'll have a show of hands. Is an evidence-based simple drug treatment protocol necessary? All right, is access to medications necessary? Is medical care delivery task sharing necessary? Is quality performance metrics necessary? Or are all of those necessary? So how many think it's only number one and nothing else? How many people think it's number two and nothing else? How about number three and nothing else? How about number four and nothing else? How many people think it's all of them? Yes, okay, Jennifer, I think we should give everyone like double Zoom and figure something out. <laughs> okay, that's right. Um, this is not only what we use in our results at Advise Initiative, but also what's been published in practice, and then I say what's been present on the World Health Organization Global Heart Dementia site. Um, I want to just talk about two other things, issues, uh, uh, briefly, besides hypertension, and that's salt. And look, salt, if you reduce salt in the community, then you can reach the patients who haven't been to the doctor to be diagnosed or treated with hypertension, right? And it's fascinating that if you can reduce sodium consumption across the community, you can reduce mean systolic blood pressure by a couple of millimeters. But when you move that bell curve over, that's a lot of, that's a lot of difference. You'll be treating people who are on medicines and who aren't on medicines. So the thing about sodium is that it's not so easy. Sodium comes from different places depending on where you are. If you go to England, sodium is mostly in bread. If you go to Thailand, it's mostly in fish sauce that's added. So the bread in England is not made at home, it's manufactured. So the strategy to, to, to diminish salt consumption in, a, uh, in any location really has to do with where does the salt come from. But again, there are ways to put the salt out of the, the, out of the food. Um, and this is an example uh, done, I can't remember if this is from uh, Finland or England, but again, oh, this is Finland, uh, again, by carefully developing a policy, you can see that sodium consumption can drop. Oh, that's right, this one is England, right? That was Finland and England. And you can see when sodium, when sodium consumption drops, blood pressure drops, and we expect, um, that the changes we see in uh, uh, mortality and heart disease decrease, and we think that's associated with the reduction in sodium across the population. So it can be done, but you have to be careful about how you do it. It's not a one size fits all. Did they look to see if weight reduction versus overall calorie consumption decrease when there's less sodium in the food? Uh, uh, no, we, do, we don't know how those two are. It's, it's hard to see that. Right, because uh, it's hard to it's hard to modify that without it and, mod and keep weight stable. But this is easy than others because sometimes uh, this isn't a sugar reduction policy. Uh, this isn't about the sugar reduction. Um, and some of these, uh, I do know that there's lots of taste tests that when the taste doesn't change. So my suspicion is that it wouldn't be changed. My suspicion is that weight would not be affected by this because this is mostly um, removing it or substituting it and not adding it at home. Well, I think it'd be very different if we talk about the blood sugar reduction. Sugar, sugar free uh, And again, this is an example of how much additional benefit sodium would, would provide in addition to the hypertension control. So question two, which of the following statements about sodium are true? In most environments, sodium is, adding, is added during manufacturing of restaurants. We'll read them all and then we'll vote. In most environments, sodium is added, is added at home, at the table, across the world, Sources of sodium are the same in all locations with four. Policies to reduce sodium consumption should target sodium sources in that specific population. How many people think it's number one? How many people think it's number two? How about number three? How about number four? You have to know where the sodium comes from. Absolutely.
also what policy do the sodium differentiate target the sources in the population? And that's because it comes from different places. And let's just briefly touch on artificial trans fats and security work. So, you know, my, our, our publicist has an interesting quote. She says, how do trans fats get into my lunch? In other words, you don't, you didn't do it. Most people don't sit at home and say, you know what? I think my food would taste a little better if I had a little trans fat. So again, the policy to eliminate trans fat is a complete solve. You can't just say, well, they're both nutritional, they should be the same. Um, and it kills about uh, 54, 540,000 people, so more than half a million people around the world every year. It raises LDL and lowers HDL. It increases the risk of heart attack and cardiovascular death. And the World Health Organization is calling for a complete elimination on the planet within the next five years. Uh, the sources of trans fat are globally varied. And, ideal, uh, and I, the al alternatives would be replaced by poly and monounsaturated fat. So here's, this, here's the, the funny news. We took out trans fat and replaced it with lard, a terrible like, fat. You'd still be better off. So we're not suggesting that we move trans fat and put terrible fats in there. But again, getting the trans fat out and putting it with healthy fats is ideal, but substituting any fat would be better. So this was launched uh, about six months ago called the Replace Package, just like, and this is from the WHO, which is really interesting. It, and the, the letter stand for something, review the dietary sources, the promote replacement, um, to legislate, to assess the levels of trans fat, to create awareness, and to support the legislation. So again, there's a package the WHO has. It's really got a roadmap about how to get trans fat out of your food. In the United States, it's not so much of a problem, but globally, it's a problem. And some places that don't have trans fat in their diet, we say, well, look, you better, you better legislate it because you don't want the trans fat to be dumped from other places. And it got a lot of press about six months ago when it was launched. Uh, and we're pretty excited about this because, again, this is different from uh, treating hypertension, but we think that through policy and legislation, this can really be in, um, enforced. And it was banned in New York City and also uh, in the United States probably shortly thereafter. And you know, the, the, the industry said, oh, you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't make the food taste well. But you know, you do it slowly uh, and uh, you provide some consultation and it can be done. Uh, and the food tastes a little bit different, but people get used to it, and it's probably worth while to see. It has no business being in there. Um, so question four, which of the following about trans fat is true? Um, and we'll go through all four and then we'll vote. It is responsible for over one half million deaths per year. It has not been eliminated yet in any country. It is not a WHO priority. It can't be eliminated without increased cost of making the food taste different. How many people think Number one, it's responsible for over half a million deaths per year. Yes, that's correct. Um, uh, and uh, and this is, uh, and it's been eliminated already in USA, Denmark, and others. Uh, the replace package is a high priority program, uh, and um, it can be reduced slowly without significant effect on cost or taste. So. Lastly, I want to point out a little plug for something called links. So if anybody's interested in this on a global scale, or even having access to any of these resources for your own personal use here in South Carolina or any place, then you can join our links community. It's free and has access to all these resources. And I think what's more important is it provides peer-to-peer -peer communication. So uh, we have over 200 people signed up through, uh, throughout the world, mostly international. If you want to know what they're doing in Chile or China or India or uh, Barbados, or Geneva, when you sign up for this group, you'll have access to emails that's part of being in the group that's saying, hey, you know what, I'm interested in sharing this, what other people are doing, besides a lot of other resources. Uh, and um, the link stands for learning the classes, implementation, networking, knowledge exchange, and support. Uh, and support, there'll be some grants, but the grants are only for those individuals of low and middle income countries. So I want you all to get excited about that. The grant money that we have, but the technical assistance is useful, whether it's emails, webinars, et cetera. So I just want to summarize it here by saying that you know cardiovascular disease is the world's biggest burden. There are three ways to address it by addressing hypertension, eliminating artificial, artificial trans fat, and reducing sodium. And um, this is a picture of uh, three health workers in India in, uh, in Chandigarh, which is outside of Punjab. And I, I just like to put this picture up here because in, in the middle of this 
desolate building in the middle of this desert, and we, we drove a long time, and we got to this building, and on the way there, I don't know, has anyone ever seen a goat on a motorcycle? No. I did. Now, the goat wasn't driving a motorcycle, but there was a guy on a motorcycle, and there was a guy behind him on a motorcycle, and the guy in the second guy was holding a goat across the motorcycle. He was on the third row, so I saw this there, but again, very, and then we got to this building, and I said, oh, it's so great to come to the clinic. And I had, it, had electricity a few hours a day. Electricity went to uh, power the back, the refrigerator for the vaccines. And it looked, you know, like it was sort of, it was like a hut. Uh, it was partially used. And they said, no, no, this is the hospital. This isn't the clinic. The clinic is the smaller building over here. So uh, when, I, when I thought about the, the tremendous challenges they had in this resource, in, in this setting, I met these four women. And these women, we went and we talked to these women and we talked about blood pressure. We said, well, why don't you just say it's over or under 140? You know, just make it easy for you. And they were like, no, 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 no. The blood pressure is really important. We actually want to write the actual number. Um, this is really important for us. Turns out they were they had an experience with their pregnant women, and who were midwives or trained as midwife helpers. And uh, it just really made me think about um, how proud and how capable and how colorful these uh, health workers were in the most desperate settings. And I think of that kind of a, a metaphor for what we need to do. Um, we need to harness our energies both here in the United States, specifically in this community in the, in the South, uh, nationally and internationally, to address the burden of cardiovascular disease, which is, for the most part, preventable. So with that, I'll go ahead and stop and take a few questions. Uh, thank you very, very much for inviting us.